Thank you very much. And hello again, dear radio friends. How in the world are you? You doing all right? Well, I trust so. Bless your heart. Hope everything's all right at your house. I'm feeling pretty good. Well, I suppose I ought to say it correctly. I am feeling very well. <laughs> I always have to watch my grammar, and that's a good thing. Say, we're looking at Psalm 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. And we were just going through some of the verses that talk about the steps, and the last time we got together, we talked about the fact that God gives you a larger footprint on life, like a radial tire with its with its fat footprint that keeps it from skidding, uh, so that none of his steps shall slip. Psalm 1836. Then I'm turning over to uh, another passage in Psalms. Uh, Psalm, let me find it here. Psalm 40 it ought to be. You hear the pages turning? That's because I'm turning them. <laughs> Psalm 40, verse 2. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Established my goings. This is a picture of a person climbing. And the, you, if, you're, if you're in the business of mountain climbing, you know that you pick your, your terrain very carefully. Uh, if you're going to set a spike in the rock or in the ice formation, you're very careful to make sure that it's established, that it, that it doesn't let go. This is the concept we have here. To be established means that when you step on something, it's not going to give way. Set my feet on a rock. It's not going to crumble under you. And that, of course, is a great source of confidence. When you're walking with God, it's not going to crumble under you. It's not going to fall away. My good friend Elliot Stettelbauer is still with us, having survived a massive stroke, and he still has that, that uh, vivacious spirit and trust in God that makes him a testimony even in times when he's anchored to a wheelchair. Businessman, he's now, I guess, in his 80s, lives up in Toronto. And, of course, he can't hear this broadcast, but uh, he doesn't mind if I talk about him. Years ago, he traveled with us in Youth for Christ because he was a member of the official board and he had his business so organized so that he could, uh, he could uh, take time off and go with us. On one such trip on his way to a World Congress in South America, he stopped off uh, in uh, Ecuador, I think it was, and uh, was going to take a picture one morning uh, from uh, his hotel window. He found, however, that looking out the window, there were some telephone poles or whatever that impeded the view, and so he thought, well, I'll just climb out on the roof. He didn't realize that that roof was made of paper-thin material, and so he stepped upon it and promptly fell through it, falling a number of feet to the concrete below. Well, it broke some bones in his uh, arm and elbow, and uh, he was badly injured there. Well, uh, surgery and, uh, and uh, an implant of different uh, parts, the joint, the elbow joint was repaired. And it gave him, uh, although somewhat limited, it gave him movement of that arm once again after the weeks had passed. I visited him then, I suppose some months later in Toronto. I said, well, Elliot, how are you getting along with that arm? Oh, he said, you know what they did? He said, I'm a General Motors dealer, and they put Ford parts in it, and it doesn't work. <laughs> well, now, any of you Ford dealers, don't write me angrily and, and scold me. That's what the man said, just for a joke. Ah, uh, yes. It gave way under him, and that led to a fall and injury. When you're walking with God, my friend, in life, on the road of life, he says, you set my feet on a rock. It's not going to collapse under you. When you trust God, it's not life itself and the circumstances are not going to collapse under you. That's what we're saying. Will you believe that today and apply it in the everyday matters that you must face this very day? Or if you're listening tonight, at late at night, the, the things you must face tomorrow as you awaken? It won't collapse under you if you're trusting your blessed Lord. 
Yeah, I'm glad for that. Then over in Proverbs, over in Proverbs, see, I'm just in the just in the beginning phrase of that verse. We've got to come back to the, the verse in Psalm 37, but right now, in Proverbs 4:12. He says, when thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened, and when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Now, straightened steps are limping steps. You're not going to have to limp through life as though uh, something was wrong with your, with your, with your uh, legs. Your steps will not be straightened, narrowed, pinched in, fenced in, limping, limited, see? God will enable you to walk through life with a steady pace. Don't you like people who, although they're under pressure, seem not to, to, to vary the, the emotional and spiritual pace of their lives? I know a few like that, and I'd like to be like them, believe me. Non-limping and non-stumbling, thou shalt not stumble. When God is guiding you, you don't have to limp through life. You can walk steadily. And then there's one more here. Uh, Proverbs 16 is the passage. And again, I turn the page, as you can hear. And it's verse 9. A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. We read in, in Proverbs 3, 6. To have God direct where you're going to step next, that is the ultimate source of confidence in life, isn't it? How does that come about? Through prayer, commitment, and faith. You take a step in faith once you're sure what God has for you to do. Someone has said the soldier of the cross has a right to remain at headquarters until he gets his marching orders. Then he can go forth into the field of battle confidently. You have a right to wait on God until you know. When you know, then take the step of faith, even though you may not have too much to go on except the command of God. You take Elijah, for example. God says, uh, hide yourself by the brook Cherith. I'll feed you there. So the ravens brought him food morning and night, and he drank of the brook. And then the brook dried up. What's going to happen next? God says, there's a widow in Zarephath. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to have her take care of you. A widow? No money? Well, it was even worse than that. When he got there, she was preparing to starve to death. She said, I have nothing in the house except a little flour, meal, she called it, and some oil, and I'm going to make a pancake with it and feed my son, and then we're going to starve to death. He said, Fear not, do as thou hast said, but make me a little cake first, which on the face of it seems an awful lot of nerve, except that he knew in his heart that God had sent him and that God would take care. And so the container of ground meal and the container of oil, the supply didn't fail throughout that following year. They were fed, the widow and her family and the prophet, because he took the step of faith and obeyed God. The priests stood at the edge of the River Jordan on, as the nation was on its way into the Promised Land. What are we going to do? The river is before us. God said, let the priests go first, and when their feet touch the water, then the waters are going to part, and that's what happened. The step of faith. The step of faith in, in obedience. Jesus said to the blind man after he had put some homemade clay on those eyelids, he said, go wash that off in the pool of Siloam. The man could have refused to do so and stayed blind. Instead, he took the steps of faith. He found his way across the city to that pool and washed and came back seeing. All through the word of God, you have evidence that God asks you to obey him and take a step of faith. Then he proves himself indeed the God of answered prayer. Now, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. 
I said ordered means you have a right to determine, you know what to determine, you know when it will come to pass, and you know the results of what you have determined. All of that is in the word ordered, and God certainly fills that definition completely, doesn't he? But it says, he delighteth in his way. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy laws within my heart, said the psalmist. He delighteth in his way. Now, it's one thing to say, God, I, I don't know, I don't like this, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. I think I may have prayed that kind of prayer many times in my life, haven't you? It's another thing to be just delighted in what God is doing in your life. Once you have committed yourself to that point of view, life becomes an adventure. It becomes an adventure, and, and, and it's an adventure with deity. And you, you look to see what the Lord has for you. My good friend, Dr. Ed Mann, who for many years was president of Eastern Nazarene College, told me that he said somebody, but I think it was he actually, prayed a prayer each morning upon awaking. Good morning, Lord. What are you up to today? Please count me in on it. Amen. <laughs> well, to, to be in on what God has in mind. He delighteth in his way. God's way is the way of delight for you. Now, I must say that sometimes I have even tearfully had to say, okay, God, I want your will. I remember just just really breaking into tears one day in the basement of the home we lived in in Wheaton, Illinois, uh, because I was going through quite a, a struggle in this matter of which way shall I go? I was at a turning point in my life. I had five or six different job offers, all of which were attractive. And there were some that I really wanted. And there was one or two of which I was very much afraid. And yet it came back again and again and again that I should be thinking about this particular one, which happened to be the offer to go to the King's College in Briarcliff Manor, New York. This is in 1960. Uh, one, actually, and the turn of 62, I don't know the exact date, it was around the turn of the year there. And I remember just, just crying. I don't cry very much. I'm not a bawler. <laughs> but I remember bursting into tears and saying, Oh, God, if you want me to go, I will. And at that point, I had peace in my heart, strangely. I went upstairs, told Corrine that I guess I'd made my decision. She said, All right, dear. And I called up Bill Miller, who at that time was the beloved chairman of the board of the King's College. I said, listen, is that deal still on? He said, yes. Well, I said, I guess you got yourself a man. He said, well, praise the Lord. And that was how it was. So I have to admit that sometimes I have tearfully and, and with great struggle yielded to God's will. But by and large, having made up your mind that you want God's will, it becomes a delight to you, doesn't it? Yes, he delighteth in his way. Well, we get at some more of this the next time we get together. Father God, today, oh, may we just delight in thy will and do it by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Till I meet you once again by way of radio, walk with the King today and be a blessing. You've just heard Walk with the King, the ministry of Dr. Robert A. Cook. This program is listener supported. For more information or how to find out how you can help continue this ministry, write to us at Walk with the King, P.O. Box 43, Trumbull, Connecticut, 06611 or visit us on the web at walkwiththeking.org. Thank you for your support of this ministry. This has been program number 7012. Thank you for listening to Walk with the King. Mm -hmm.